In the days of the buffalo, the great northern plains were the hunting grounds of my people. To most Americans, we're known as the Sioux. Our own name is Lakota. Our territory included much of what is now North and South Dakota, Northern Nebraska, and Eastern Wyoming. In Lakota, my name is Oma Katanka. It means great wide world. The white man, he calls me Milo Yellowhair. At the center of our lands, there is a sacred place. We call it Chesapa, the Black Hills, the heart of everything that is. It was here that my ancestors came to pray. When the white man came here, he found gold and he stole the Black Hills. The U.S. government outlawed the Lakota religion. For more than a hundred years, we have fought for the return of this sacred place. It has been a struggle with the white man and a struggle with ourselves. To most Americans, the Black Hills of South Dakota are best known for a big rock carving. During the summer months, 20,000 people a day visit Mount Rushmore. This huge sculpture, blasted out of native rock, is called the Shrine of Democracy. Here, visitors have an opportunity to reflect on the values that shaped American history. With the attraction of Mount Rushmore, tourism dominates the economy of the Black Hills bringing over $100 million a year to white-owned businesses. Few Indians have managed to adapt to the new conditions. In this America, the Indian is just a relic. Thank you very much. miles away, east of the Black Hills, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation begins. It was here, in the Badlands, that my people were rounded up a hundred years ago and forced onto lands that the white man had no use for. This is my home, the home of the Ogallala, one of the seven bands of the Lakota Nation. As you cross onto the reservation, you feel a change, a different sense of time. 
My people did not adapt well to the white man's world. Far from the tourist in the Black Hills, Indian reality begins. <laughs> The Oglalas are the descendants of the great warriors, Red Cloud and Crazy Horse. <laughs> My feeling is that uh, the Oglalas still continue to remind the United States that there's a people inside the bound, exterior boundaries of the United States that are not like them. Uh, I recall that uh, some of the books as recent as 10 years ago and even now uh, depict the Indians as uh, poor, poverty-stricken, uh, helpless victims of progress. Uh, okay, that might be true for the people who look at us that way, but for many of us, to live in, in this state is by choice. Uh, choice primarily uh, initiated and driven by uh, the love for the land. Regardless of how the land is now, we feel, uh, at least the traditional Lakotas feel, that we all come from the land. The origin legend of any people gives you the underpinnings for the social fabric of that people for everything good in that society, and also all of the corruptions in any society. Among the Lakota, our origin legend, we call the Otrokahe stories. In our story, it starts out at the time of first motion, Ian is, before anything has meaning, Ian is. The spirit of Ian is Wakantanka. And so Ian takes from the core of Ian's self and sends it to the surface. And we call this place Wamankha Ognanka Ichante, the heart of everything that is. This is the Black Hills. Uh, the Black Hills are the oldest, one of the oldest places on the face of the earth. They're six billion years old. Um, there's always, from the creation of earth, there's, that place was special. We also say that we were created and we spread out from the Black Hills. We uh, came back to the Black Hills during the cleansing and then we scattered again from there. Our pipe was brought to us in the Black Hills, the sacred pipe. Uh, the seven sacred ceremonies of the pipe were given to the people in the Black Hills. Uh, the seven nations gathered at the Black Hills every seven years. So there's a, a whole, I guess, thousands of years of relationship to the Black Hills that this is a, all of the earth is sacred. This place is the most special place on earth. Uh, it was so sacred no one lived in there on a permanent basis. It was only a place you could go in and go out of, like the Holy of Holies for the Hebrews. Uh, they had a responsibility from the very beginning of creation to act in a certain way to the buffalo and to the coyote and the snake and other animals. In the ceremonies, you can assume the form of those animals. And when you do, you have to contribute something to their knowledge of the universe, and they contribute something to yours. Uh, those are real ceremonies, and these things really take place. So when you say uh, the land is sacred, what you're talking about is a particular geography that involves all kinds of people and animals, uh, which is a little different than having an ancestral estate in France and, and being able to trace back to Charlemagne. Now, that's a very valid thing, but it doesn't involve all of creation, see? And the Indian perception involves duties and responsibilities. Now, if you're taken off that land and you can't fulfill those responsibilities, then the rest of creation starts to become alienated because you're not doing your part. And you see, then you begin to get in severe trouble. And, and if you talk to some of the holy men up there, they will say that a lot of the social problems of the Sioux uh, are a result of losing the Black Hills so you couldn't perform your duties. You couldn't become a contributor to the ongoing creation. And consequently, your people started to fall away and they started to suffer and they started to fight among themselves.
troubles of my people began with the loss of the buffalo. The buffalo provided my great grandparents with their food, their clothing, and their shelter. But in the 1860s, white immigrants traveling west on what we call the Thieves Road began to slaughter the buffalo. Hostilities between the Indians and whites grew. Led by Chief Red Cloud, the Lakotas went to war. They pushed back the Long Knives and forced the U.S. government to negotiate a peace treaty. The Treaty of Fort Laramie, signed in 1868, set aside the Black Hills in all of western South Dakota for the exclusive use of the Sioux. White men were forbidden to enter. But the buffalo were disappearing, so Red Cloud and his band settled near the fort, tempted by the government's offer of free food, liquor, and tools. But a young warrior named Crazy Horse never signed the treaty. He and his followers remained on the Lakota hunting grounds and refused to join Red Cloud at the fort. The split between Red Cloud and Crazy Horse, between the hang around the fort Indians and the traditionalists, the so-called hostiles, would drive a wedge between the Lakota people that would last more than a century. But after the treaty, prospectors found gold in the Black Hills. In 1874, General George Armstrong Custer led an illegal army expedition through the Sioux lands to confirm the discovery. He returned with tales of nuggets just waiting to be picked from the ground. After the discovery of gold, the U.S. government pressured the Sioux to change the treaty and sell the Black Hills. But Crazy Horse refused to even consider negotiations. He declared, one does not sell the land on which the people walk. In 1876, General Custer attacked Crazy Horse's encampment on the banks of the Little Bighorn. In a shocking defeat, the Sioux annihilated Custer's full command. My own great-grandfather, Tulance, rode with Crazy Horse that day. But a year later, under pressure from the army and with the buffalo nearly extinct, Crazy Horse and his starving band finally surrendered. A few months later, he was killed by white soldiers and the newly created Indian police. Despite his importance, no photograph of Crazy Horse was ever taken and his burial site remains a secret even today. In 1889, Congress annexed the Black Hills. Thousands of fortune seekers poured into the sacred land of the Sioux. The vast Lakota territories shrank down to a few small reservations. Today, the Pine Ridge Reservation is the poorest place in the United States. It is a land with no visible industry or businesses. In an economy where land has no spiritual value, but is only equal to money, the 20,000 Lakota who live here have not done well. Unemployment on the reservation is over 80% and welfare is the main source of income. A single person receives $32 every two weeks. There isn't any jobs. That's the main problem we have on the reservation is there's no jobs. If there is a job, a place that where a lot of people could be employed, I don't, I don't think a lot of the, the families wouldn't be drawing ADC or getting general assistance. But since a lot of stuff closed down on the reservation, everybody's been drawing food stamps and commodities. The village of Pine Ridge is the seat of local government. The Bureau of Indian Affairs 
is the source of federal money and is by far the largest employer on the reservation. The majority who live here are of mixed Indian and white blood. In the old days, Indian agents responsible for the equal distribution of rations didn't care who got them, and Indians who lived close by, the ones called hanger on the forts, got more than their share. In many ways, the situation remains the same today. The town of Pine Ridge and its political hierarchy received a lion's share of federal aid. And Oglalas who live in the remote districts of the reservation get less. If you go in a BIA office or a tribal building, you won't see any food blood sitting in there. You'll be seeing, seeing food bloods, uh, half braids and washitas. They're all in there. They're, they're taking over everything. What's the matter with the, with the mixed bloods? Uh, one day they'll be Indian, next day they'll be white. White. Yeah. One day, yeah, they'll turn it. One day they'll be good. One day they'll, yeah. they'll turn the other. Yeah. 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 And then you know, there's are. a lot of these full bloods that do have. They're uh, well educated, but nowadays, like Burn said, you can't go in any office and apply for a job on this reservation unless you have green or blue eyes, and if you're light skinned. The tribe is caught between the desperation of unemployment and the breakdown of the culture. The level of hopelessness can be measured by the high rate of alcoholism. The sale and consumption of alcohol are outlawed on the reservation, but a good part of the federal aid dollars end up in border towns boosting the local economy with the liquor trade. Many have fallen with a bottle in their hand. You see a lot of these houses where all they've got is a mattress on the floor and a bedroom with some blankets, maybe an old uh, uh, table with a couple of broken chairs, some commodities in the cupboard, very little food in the refrigerator. You see a lot of child neglect. You see a lot of drunken people. You see a lot of people waiting for each other to pass out so that they can rip each other off, this sort of thing. You see a lot of beatings, all that drunkenness seems to bring. I guess some people think they're having a good time, but if you're not drunk yourself, it looks like you walk through the gates of hell or something in some areas. A lot of things that, that, that are with me today um, in my memories about attempts to escape from the reality of what was going on, the drunkenness, and we see, we see a lot of Indian people who are drunk. They may be the only warriors who are saying that they don't want to accept anything, any more, one more day of white society, and that they would just soon kill themselves drinking. Slow death. And I, I've thought many times and, and along those lines because I myself went through it and I didn't want to accept one more day of, of, of living in a society that was crushing and devastating and murdering the culture of our people and the spirituality. In the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration tried a new solution to the problems on the reservation. It was called termination. The government pressured Indians to leave the reservation and move to the city. When they get to the city, they expect, and they've heard rumors of five, six, seven dollar an hour jobs, nice apartments, running water, bathrooms, showers, and they expect to find us. Well, what these new urban Indians usually found were ghettos, minimum wage jobs, unemployment, poverty, and despair. The man of the family can't cope with these problems, as I say. He, 
I've never been faced with him on a reservation. On a reservation, at least he could always go out and kill a deer or go out and hunt or fish and bring meat home to his family. Here in the city, there's nothing for him. In the late 1960s, out of the urban red ghettos created by the government's policy grew AIM, the American Indian Movement. Among the early leaders of this emerging liberation movement were men like Dennis Banks and Leonard Peltier. In 1959, when Eisenhower was pushing the termination policy and he was trying to re relocate every, all the Indians onto, uh, onto, uh, into the major cities, right? And uh, Turtle Mountain was, I think, was number three on the list to be uh, fully terminated. And we were given, uh, the people were given an option either to be relocated or to uh, just stay on the reservation, not receive no benefits, no whatever. And uh, at that time, I started attending a lot of meetings with my father, who was going to uh, a lot of me meetings around the community. And uh, I got interested in it that, uh, from then on because I heard some very emotional speeches made by women, you know, pleading and begging for some of the men to do something because their children are at home starving. And uh, it, uh, it, it had a very uh, strong effect on me. I, uh, I had swore at that time that, you know, as a young man, fantasizing, daydreaming, I thought, well, I'm going to uh, grow up and I'm going to help my people. Inspired by the civil rights movement, city Indians traveled back to the reservations to look for an identity their parents had lost. My friend, Virgil Kilstraight and I were young men on the Pine Ridge Reservation in those days. All of a sudden, Pine Ridge became the magnet that attracted newborn Indians. Virgil and I were the descendants of Crazy Horse's traditional Lakotas, and it was exciting for us to watch our city cousins rediscover their culture. The memory of that time, of that reawakening, is still bright. We would like the library that never got used. You know, I think that that's probably what I would say, you know. The Fubas never really lost anything. They've always had it. Uh, it was the people who came back and who gained quite a bit. It was the same people who, whose parents have lost quite a bit within that. The, the, city, the city movement, you know, all of a sudden, it was cool to be an Indian because all the other young white kids were uh, epitomizing Indians. You know, long hair, beads, uh, the leather clothes, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, whatever it is, you know. It was always this, you know. And so the, the Indian kid looks at this and he's trying to sit there, you know, wearing a, a shirt and tie and uh, looking at it and says, hey, well, maybe there is something here, you know. So he looked back and he looked at the readings, the writings and the books that was written about him. And he says, well, I like this, I like that, I like this. And then he, then it, his interest was formed. Then he says, well, I asked my dad where I came from. He went back and he said, oh, yeah, you, you, you have people living on the reservation back there, you know. So he comes back to the reservation and they uh, maybe stuck him in a sweat lodge. And then they took all the doubts away from him. And now he's looking at other people and said, oh, there's old man kills enemy. There's old man... Uh, uh, catches and there's old men uh, this you know jumping bulls two bulls all of these all of a sudden they are finding out they are like a people who recently discovered their face you know and they say oh wow I I'm here you know and then all of a sudden they said okay you have always had this and I think I think this is what the role that the reservation had played oh me on the watch thing good morning my grandfather always said, uh, good morning, and he honey was In the old country, the young Indians met a Lakota medicine man named Henry Crow Dog. He was a living link to the past, to the old ways his family had maintained. He told the young activists that to be fully Indian, the new political movement needed a spiritual foundation, that what was most important was a spiritual connection to the land. Everything is in place. Well, uh, well, that's good. Everything is in place and everything just the same is good. That's all right. From the holy men, AIM members 
begin to learn about the Black Hills and the long history of broken treaties. And they also confronted the stark reality of life on the reservation. In 1972, AIM launched a series of demonstrations with traditional leaders, which culminated in a march on the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. The march to protest conditions on the reservation was called the Trail of Broken Treaties. This is our land. This is our country. We're the natives of this country. This, right here, the federal ground is our property, yes. We want someone, one of our kind here, and, and doing our thing for us. Why in the hell do we have to put up with some I don't know people? <laughs> The Indians managed to capture headlines by taking over the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But when the occupation ended, television reports focused on major damage to the property. AIM had gone to Washington as a civil rights organization. Now they were seen as a threat by federal authorities and they returned to South Dakota with the reputation as a radical political group. Back on Pine Ridge, AIM began a series of demonstrations against racism in towns bordering the reservation. Their growing activism in alliance with the traditional Lakotas put them at odds with the BIA-sponsored local government, then headed by tribal chairman Dick Wilson. It was a rekindling of the old divisions dating back to the days of Crazy Horse and Red Cloud. It was the old split between the hostiles and the hang around the Fort Indians. Dick Wilson was elected in Pine Ridge, as many people had been elected before him and since him, according to the American system. But it didn't mean much to the old traditional full bloods who lived outside of Pine Ridge, out in the districts. And to prove that it didn't mean much to them, uh, you would have to see what their grievances are. Their grievances were that the Pine Ridge government was ignoring the outlying districts, that it would do nothing to take care of their grievances for them that all of the money that was being taken in by the tribe from the U.S. government was being spent mostly in Pine Ridge on the mixed bloods, the oligarchy that understood the American system, and that the full bloods and the traditionalists were being ignored. In January 1973, in a town near Pine Ridge, a young Lakota named Wesley Bad Hartbull was stabbed to death by a white man. When the authorities charged the white man with involuntary manslaughter instead of murder, AIM led the protest. When you charge a white man, premeditated murder, you charge him with second degree manslaughter. And we ain't going for it anymore. And I know this whole damn town is an armed camp. When the prosecutor refused to up the charge to murder, the Indians rioted. <laughs> administration, tribal chairman Dick Wilson organized opposition to AIM. I think every one of us is aware of what happened to the Bureau of Indian Affairs building in Washington back in November. At that time, a threat was made via telephone from Mr. Russell Means to the secretary of the Ogallala Sioux tribe, Toby Eaglebo, that they wanted to come into Billy Mills Hall here and hold a victory dance. We, of course, said no way. He responded in this way. He said, get your pigs together. We're coming in anyway, and we're going to take Billy Mills Hall, and we're going to use it. We're going to have our victory dance. To counter the threat of the militants, the BIA provided Wilson with financial support. The tribal chairman used the government money to hire a group of Indian vigilantes. They were known as the Goon Squad. These people that were hired were law-abiding citizens of this reservation. People that had jobs, many of them did. 
They didn't want the same thing happening here that happened in Washington. As tensions increased, Dick Wilson used the goon squad and BIA police to threaten any political opposition. They beat and harassed traditional tribal members. The worst thing was the prohibition against public meetings. At the time AIM came in, the tribal government was forbidding any public meetings and used the police to break up any that tried to start. So it was just like a police state, which is really what was behind the uh, decision to make a last stand at Wounded Knee. A century ago, on December 29th, 1890, at Wounded Knee, South Dakota, the U.S. Army, Custer's old regiment, shot down 300 unarmed Lakota men, women, and children. They were accused of performing an outlawed ceremony called the Ghost Dance. The bodies of Chief Bigfoot and his followers were piled into a mass grave. It was the last massacre of the Indian Wars. Wounded Knee was the darkest hour in Lakota history and it became a potent symbol for all Indians. On the night of February 28, 1973, the American Indian movement led a band of rebels into Wounded Knee, just miles from Pine Ridge. They captured the town, sacked the general store, and barricaded themselves against the police. It was an audacious stand to gain national attention. The 300 insurgents were immediately surrounded by combat-trained federal marshals, FBI agents, and Wilson's vigilantes. The next morning, the world woke up to reports of a new Indian war. I left college and went straight to the reservation to help move supplies into Wounded Knee. We proclaimed the independent Oglala Nation, demanded an end to the corrupt system of tribal government, the removal of Dick Wilson, and the return of the Black Hills. The takeover would become a long, bitter two and a half month siege, the largest armed conflict in the United States since the Civil War. government forces during a harsh winter, a sense of dignity and confidence emerged within the embattled camp. Inside Wounded Knee, the dream of a free Indian society was reborn. For 71 days, I never worried about a BIA person coming to tell me what to do, or a BIA police officer telling me what to do, or a BIA administration telling me what to sign or not sign, or what deed that could be uh, authorized, or what resolution was passed. No white person ever came anything, uh, and came up to me and said anything to me about get moving, or that this land is my land and you cut your land over there. Um, for once, the uh, white people came up and asked me, you know, for direction. What, you know, can I do this or can I do that? And there was a sense of freedom of really being free and I didn't want to I didn't want that to end and I realized that when it was over that it would be downhill after 71 days the Indians surrendered when the government promised to consider their grievances but negotiations never resulted in any progress on the issues instead conditions only worsened the FBI and federal prosecutors conducted a large-scale investigation of the American Indian movement, tying up its leaders in high-profile trials. Back on Pine Ridge, the anger and animosity provoked by Wounded Knee engulfed the tribe. With AIM tied up in the courtrooms, Dick Wilson was free to pursue a vendetta on the reservation. Any house rumored to shelter a political opponent of Wilson could become the target of a drive-by shooting. One evening in 1974, 
the Richards family was attacked. Five family members were wounded. I got hit in two places, and then I saw John's arm go, and then I just laid down with him, and then just that quickly it was over. The house was full of powder from the walls, and I turned and I was running into the kitchen, and my stepfather was laying, and there was just blood everywhere, and Lulu was laying half in and half out of the house, and Dokes was under the table, and it was just total confusion. There were kids laying all over. My other little sisters and my little stepsisters were laying on the ground. I didn't know who was dead and who was alive. And a neighbor pulled in and he took us to the hospital. And that car was going down the road and somebody was still firing. We had no protection from our own police. We had no protection from the FBI. We had no protection from the U.S. Marshals or any kind of um, law enforcement agencies that exist. I felt like they were all working together and that we had to protect ourselves because it was the police that shot us up. There was no investigation afterwards. Well, I guess it wasn't really law and order. It was, it was protection, protecting the people that were here that didn't support AIM, you know. And Tribal uh, member Dwayne Brewer uh, was a leader of the goon squad. That was, you know, mostly it. We, like I said, we would never allowed these people to come into town and raise hell. If they did, we always we were always gathered up. Um, this house right here was firebombed on the corner. Um, the houses I'm talking about that were shot up a lot are the ones that are up here. How can you justify that kind of shooting at these guys? You really can't. You just got away with it, you know. This, it was going on all the time. If they wasn't shooting around and, you know, and raising hell, then uh, we was. You know? So it wasn't just all goons. This little crew up here raised hell quite a bit and done a lot of shooting, too. The violence engulfed all of us, and we all had to take sides. Many of us believed that the federal forces on the reservation had sided with the goons. AIM was prosecuted whenever and wherever possible while goon violence was either condoned or overlooked. The U.S. Civil Rights Commission asked the Justice Department to investigate FBI bias, but no charges were ever brought. I'm not aware of any alignment that we made with a vigilante group. Uh, again, our utmost desire was to keep the peace uh, and to prevent uh, loss of life. And, uh, if our agents uh, are alleged to have violated the law, then they are held and uh, they can be held like any citizen to account for themselves. So when you speak of harassment, of terror, uh, there are certainly civil rights and counter charges uh, that have been made, but I haven't seen uh, success uh, in those areas where they've been able to prove some of these allegations that you're now bringing up. Did the FBI like you? I got along good with them. Yeah, I, they probably thought I was a funny guy. You know. <laughs> Have all these weapons and, 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 and stand out as much as we did in MDs and, and, and all of the situations we were involved in. And uh, yeah, we wasn't afraid. They probably run my name through the computer and said, he's got, you know, sitting there with four weapons and he doesn't have a permit for any of them. But, uh, when they came to your house and they saw all those weapons, did they give you anything besides the intelligence, uh, that is, information about AIM? Did they give you any physical items at all? Um, well, I know they, you know, one time they gave me some armor-piercing 357 Magnum ammo. Here, you know, in case, you know, they're... <laughs> in case they're uh, behind, in, in a brick building or something, or, you know, just, just give them to me, but here. They were, they're expensive rounds, you know. You don't get them anymore. They only go to law enforcement people. So, yeah. But, you know, we had them. We had all that stuff. Why would the FBI give you armor person rounds? Probably so that, you know, I did. I had enough weapon, enough ammo to, to do a job. Against of, him? That was who we were having war with, you know. During the three years after Wounded Knee, 60 people were murdered on Pine Ridge in the Tribal Civil War. Most were supporters of AIM. A sense of helplessness and isolation terrified reservation families. A number of Indian delegates from uh, 
from the Lakota Nation came down there and again pleaded for uh, some American Indian movement help because uh, Indian people were being brutalized, being killed, uh, were being beaten, were being uh, terrorized. Uh, I think Rosalind Jumpin' Bull was one of them and a number of different other Indian, well, elderly ladies. So I, uh, I organized a couple of uh, carloads of people to go down there with Dennis and everybody else. So we went down to, uh, that's how we ended up in Pine Ridge at that, that second time. When Peltier returned, he and a group of young A members established a hidden camp near the remote hamlet of Ogallala. Residents in the area had grown increasingly fearful of the goon squad. On the morning of June 26, 1975, 99 years after Custer was defeated, two FBI agents chased a car onto this property. A shootout erupted. After a day-long gun battle, the two FBI men were found dead. One young Indian had been killed by police gunfire. Peltier and the other Indians escaped into the hills. 200 FBI agents were flown to Pine Ridge in search of the killers. It was the largest manhunt in FBI history. The Ogallalas don't like what happened. And if the FBI don't get them, the Ogallalas will. What do you mean? Just what I said. We have our own way of punishing people that way. Shooting on the reservation? You said it. We'll take care of them. Nine months after the shootout at Pine Ridge, Peltier was captured and returned to stand trial for the murder of the two FBI agents. The Indians protested that the government wanted him not for murder, but for his politics. His trial brought Peltier national attention, but the judge would not allow any evidence about the political violence on the reservation. Peltier was convicted of murder and sentenced to two life terms. Five years later, Peltier's lawyers won the release of a secret FBI document which indicated that his gun did not fire the fatal shots. But his latest appeal, based on this discovery of withheld evidence, has been denied a hearing by the Supreme Court. For many Indians, Leonard Peltier had become the latest symbol of the resistance and the spirit of Crazy Horse. The year after the FBI agents were killed, Dick Wilson was defeated in tribal elections. The goon squad disbanded. The American Indian movement lost its prominence in the political landscape and the violence subsided. But for the Lakota, the tribal civil war had overshadowed the vision of the return of the Black Hills. Today, the Black Hills are still occupied by the white men. Tourism and gold mining are flourishing. At the peak of the summer season, the sacred land of the Lakota is the site of the largest motorcycle rally in the world. But for more than a hundred years, the Lakota people had never abandoned their claim to the Black Hills. Generations of tribal leaders continued to battle for the land in the courts. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld a lower court decision that the Black Hills had been stolen from the Sioux. The ruling said, a more ripe and rank case of dishonorable dealing will never be found in the history of our country. A payment of $122 million was ordered. Although the Lakota people had very little money, they refused the payment. When the Supreme Court wrote that decision, they recognized this was a, uh, not the most honorable thing that ever took place. That is, that the Indians were probably taken advantage of. But nevertheless, it's something that the United States government did. And it's history. And so it's something that's got to be lived with. And we're trying to abide by the law of the land, and that is when something is taken by the government, uh, the person from whom it is taken is entitled to just compensation. The Supreme Court says you've got to do that. 
you've got to pay them just compensation, and that has been arrived at. Some of the Indians are now saying, hey, we don't want the money, we want the land back. But that isn't the way it works. History has moved on down the road, and you can't go back to 1877. You can't bring the buffalo back. Before the 1970s, many Indians might have given up and taken the money. But the militancy of that time sparked the resurgence of Lakota spirituality on the reservation. After a lifetime of teaching the old ways, the medicine man Henry Crow Dog died in 1985. He had taught a new generation of Indians that what was fundamental to Indianness was the spiritual connection to the land. In the beginning, it was the young men from the cities who listened. But after the Civil War on Pine Ridge, the mixed bloods began to find a new respect for the traditional ways. of Crazy Horse that one does not sell the land on which the people walk and that to sell the Black Hills would be like selling your mother. Those teachings would now blossom into a widespread demand for the return of the Black Hills. The Lakotas were now determined to pursue the difficult course of legislative action. New Jersey Senator Bill Bradley proposed a compromise solution to give back all federal land in the Black Hills. This is a congressional act that would cede to the Sioux Nation 1.3 million acres of land in the Black Hills area of South Dakota. Now there's no private land involved, no state-owned land involved. Uh, all rights of access uh, timber rights, grazing rights, mineral rights that are exi existing now would continue to exist. It would create a Sioux National Park that would be available for everyone to come and visit. And I think that it would right a wrong that was done to the Sioux uh, many years ago. And in that sense, I think that it's the kind of thing that reflects on the best traditions of America to right this kind of wrong. The Bradley Bill died in 1987, but similar proposals are pending. The legislation does not threaten any existing rights, but any offer to return land to Indians is strongly opposed by most whites in South Dakota. I told one guy that was here, uh, he said that this place and my ranch uh, really is Indian land. I said, no, it isn't. I says, I uh, got this land, some of it I bought from homesteaders, and my dad homesteaded some of it. And uh, they homesteaded it from the United States government. And the United States government bought it in the Louisiana Purchase from the French, so if you have an argument, go argue with the French. They sold it. Listen, I don't think the Indian would have hollered if he wouldn't have had these rabble-rousers put these notions in their head, like AIM. We never had any problem with them before. They'd get drunk once in a while, but like anybody does, most anybody. But they never had no problem with them. Heck, we got along with them good, and I think we, I really think we get along with them good now. In any war, which you read your history books, and you can read the Indian Wars. Such and such, just it's listed in your history. And when you lose a battle or lose a war, why then you have to suffer the consequences. They're conquered people. If you conquer a people, then it's got to stand. That's just like if some big guy comes, gives you a thrashing, 
you stay thrashed. Or if you want to try him again, well, I guess you can. But the end result might be the same. Good chance of it. Today, the Lakota people are more unified than any time I can remember. In the old days, only the full bloods came to the summer powwow on Pine Ridge. Even among our own people, there was a kind of racism. The full bloods were called big bucks or big Indians, and they were thought to be stupid. But since the Civil War, things have changed. Now, the mixed bloods also come to dance. For them, I think they saw they had to make a choice to be an Oglala and all that it entails, or go the other way and have nothing at all. I kind of halfway believed a long time ago in some of the ways, but you know, I never was involved in it because of my light skin. You know. It was hard to get into a, any little group, that, the traditional group, because you know they were so, so strong. Now it's kind of opened up for all of us. Just some of your friends that are that are full bloods and stuff say, you know, you ought to come out to my house. I mean, we have good sweats, so, you know, and it doesn't have to be a religious one, you know. It can be just for the good feeling, you know, and. That's a simple prayer. That, I don't know, you know, going to them for three years, really getting involved in it, and then to, to go around all of these people that you were at war with, you know, you learned that you can't go and, you know, be having a ceremony for trying to heal somebody or pray for them so that their future can be good and, and, and have hatred for them, you know. You, they teach you in simple ways. It's, it's not to carry hatred in you. That's a sickness, you know. And, so just by you know going out and doing it and being around them people, I think that I got rid of a lot of my hatred and stuff, you know. And they probably got rid of a lot of hatred for me too because you know we get along. Buried in the cemetery at Wounded Knee are the last 100 years of the history of my people. This is the mass grave of the 300 Lakotas massacred in 1890. Here too is the grave of Glenn Three Stars. He was a prominent member of the Goon Squad. He is buried next to Milo Goings, who was inside Wounded Knee in 1973. Five generations have now passed since Crazy Horse was killed. Nobody knows where he is buried. The vision of Crazy Horse was to stop the encroachment of the white man through the medicine of the mole, who can come out of the ground anywhere, any place, any time, to fight. He may come back in 10 different people, 10 different ideas, and become very powerful, and then suddenly disappear. Now a new generation holds his vision for the return of the Black Hills. The spirit of Crazy Horse is alive and still travels on this land. public affairs programs on Channel 44, starting with the McLaughlin Group. A look at the week's important events that's always concise, always controversial. The McLaughlin Group next, McLaughlin one-on-one -on -one at 9.30. And remember, if you made a pledge to public television last week, please fulfill it right away. We're counting on you.